Good morning. How we doing? Ready to go? Welcome to Stone Creek Church. My name is Troy. I want to welcome those who are watching online as well. It's just a pleasure uh, to be with you. I'm excited to, to share God's truth. This morning, what you just saw was a clip of the greatest basketball player ever. <laughs> Whatever, LeBron fans. He is the greatest ever. <clears throat> And I think this was like 2003. It was his last game in Chicago, even though he was playing for the Wizards. And they were just showing their appreciation and approval for the six championships and just the memories. And so they gave him an amazing, I think it was a five-minute standing ovation. Right? So it was really awesome. Just took me back a little bit watching that what clip. Standing ovation. Um, it is an occurrence that you see at an event where people literally stand up and they applaud to show appreciation, approval, or even respect. Do you know that the longest standing ovation ever recorded is 80 minutes long? That's like driving from here to and from Bloomington, and they still clap. They still give it up. <laughs> and it was done to the great opera tenor Placido Domingo in 1991. If you've never heard him sing, it is unbelievable. 80-minute standing ovation. And this morning, I want to share with you, so excited to share with you, an issue that we've been dealing with since the creation of man, since it all began for human beings. And I believe it's the, part of the root of sin entering our world and birthing a sinful nature in us. This issue we see discussed so many times in Scripture and very clearly in Galatians chapter 1. So if you want to go ahead and go to Galatians chapter 1, we're going to read 1 through 10. Galatians 1 verses 1 through 10. Just a bit of context. This is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the Galatians, Christians, which was a city in uh, uh, Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And Apostle Paul actually visited this city each of his three missionary journeys. So he loved and cared for these people. He definitely loved the church. But he started to hear that there were some people in the midst trying to confuse Christians about the gospel. So this is a letter about correction. It's a letter about uh, just, just getting people encouraged to follow the gospel. And so we're going to read Galatians 1, 1 through 10. It says this, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all of the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6 says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accept it, let them be eternally condemned. And verse 10 says, I am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I even love the New Living Translation says this, it says, obviously, right? I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I will not be Christ's servant. Amen. The sermon title this morning is Standing Ovation. Whose applause am I living for? Standing Ovation. 
whose applause am I living for? Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we thank you and we need you this morning. I need this message, and I'm sure there are many that are here that need to hear truth. And so, God, I thank you and praise you for this opportunity to be used by you to love on your people with words. So, Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I myself was a part of a standing ovation, not personally, but I was a part of a team. When I coached at Missouri State University in 2003, we were to go play at the best team of the league's uh, home court, and that was the Creighton Blue Jays. At the time, there were no question the best in our league and had the best player in the league by name of, a guy by name of Kyle Korver, who was still shooting jump shots for the Cleveland Cavaliers in the NBA, one of the best shooters I've ever seen. And so we were not supposed to even be in the game, not even supposed to be close because they were that good. I think at the time they were ranked top 20 in the country. Uh, I think the game was even on national television. So we go in there and we play as hard as we possibly can play. We take them to overtime, but we end up losing. But as we left the court, the Blue Jay fans stood up and gave us a standing ovation. Now, some of you can be thinking, well, that wasn't for y'all. That was for their team. <laughs> you know, but here's the deal. I've been around sports a long time. If you're supposed to win, your home crowd ain't giving you no standing ovation. You may get some sighs of relief or some boos because it shouldn't have been close. But then we got some verbal affirmation as their fans were just telling us that they appreciated what we did. Standing ovation. Whose applause are you living for? Pastor Francis Chan once said this. He said, my concern as a pastor is that people, Christians, who think they're going to be with God forever will not. Listen to me. That is my heart for you this morning. That as I stand here as a minister of the gospel, that's my concern. That some of us who think that we're going to be with God forever will not. And that just breaks me. And so my prayer this morning is that God will reveal truth so we can live out the life God has called us to live. That we can walk out the life God has mapped out for each and every one of us. So that is my prayer that we hear truth this morning. You see, we live in a pleasure-seeking, selfish culture that constantly tempts our sinful nature, like every day. A world that's consumed with self-gratification and and people pleasing. See, we see it reflected in so many things, even in advertising. We have slogans like, have it your way. I know some of y'all went to Burger King. I act like y'all ain't been to Burger King. (laughs) Or, Or just do it. Or one of my favorites, whatever happens in Vegas, yeah, y'all know it. But let me tell you the truth. Whatever happens in Vegas never stays in Vegas. As a matter of fact, whatever happens in Vegas may beat you home and be waiting for you when you get home. That's just truth. And then we, we have some songs. I'm a little older than, than probably most of you here. There was this one hit single by this lady named Janet Jackson, and, and it was called, What Have You Done For Me Lately? <laughs> had women all over the world singing this song, What Have You Done For Me Lately? Confront men with the lyrics. Just, just confront men with, with, with all the lyrics. It said something like, I never asked for more than I deserve. You know what's the truth. You seem to think your God gets to this earth, and I'm telling you, no way. That's what Janet said, because Janet probably thinks she's God's gift to this earth and had all women just confront men about this song. (laughs) What have you done for me lately? In our culture, we are bombarded with this message of get all the pleasure and satisfaction you can get while you can and try to impress people. That's the message In our culture. See, hedonism is a relentless pursuit of pleasure or satisfaction, a pursuit that doesn't stop until we gain the approval of others or fulfill our selfish desires. You see, I think we all, well, most of us, 
try to please really two types of people. It would be other folks and ourselves. You see, for me growing up, it was really two people. It was my dad, and it was the coach that was coaching me at that moment. I wanted to make my dad proud of everything I did, and I want every coach to be impressed by my abilities. And I remember one time growing up in Danville, we had this, uh, I love playing baseball, we had this hit and throw contest. And we had several parks throughout the city, and in each park, you would take the best from that park, and you would get them all together and compete for the city hit and throw contest champion. And so I knew, because I was good, I was, I was, I was a good baseball player, that I'm one of the best at this park, I'm going to win this easy. So the first thing we did was we get a baseball and we just threw it and I, I you know, I out threw them boys. I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't a problem. And I was no question one of the best hitters in our league, but they threw a little wrinkle in the hitting part. You see, if you pitch the ball to me, I can hit it, but we had to throw it up. I'm like, what? Ain't nobody going to pitch me the ball? I got to throw the ball up and hit it. Man, I met, man, I was horrible and I didn't make it. I didn't qualify. My father was so disappointed in me, it broke me. He went home telling my siblings how bad I was. I'm like, Dad. <laughs> like, but then I think it was that same year in an all-star game, I had three, I had three home runs. And to see the joy on his face, he was so happy and proud. He was asking people, where's the MVP trophy at? Like, shouldn't my boy get the MVP? And I'm like, look at my dad, proud of me, right? <laughs> He just talked about me a couple months ago, but now he's, he's proud. For me, it was, it was daddy. Who is your other people? Who are the people that you are trying to please? And then, of course, it's self. You see, trying to please self can lead us to misuse our money. It can lead us to getting into bad relationships and ending good ones. It can lead us into turning a computer into something that's dishonorable and evil. See, our selfish desires can lead us to, to, to lie, and it can lead us to cheat through life. It can lead us to steal and abuse our power and authority we may have over people. Selfishness, self-gratification. See, this idea of seeking the approval of others and pleasing self is rampant in the Bible. And it becomes very clear the outcome of such pursuit that leads to these three things. The first is this, disappointment and discontentment. The sense of never being satisfied. I remember a couple years ago watching the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship. The game ended. It was a Monday night, probably like 930, confetti. They're cutting the nets down. They're singing One Shiny Moment, one of my favorite songs. And, 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 and they're, it's 1030 at night on a Monday night. National champion. I think it was Villanova. By 8 o'clock the next morning, I get an alert on my phone from Bleacher Report or something predicting next year's champion. I'm like, they just won. It's not even 24 hours and they're already talking about next year. Let me ask you this. Are you tired of that new thing you just bought six months ago? Six weeks ago? Six days ago? You need to understand this truth. We as people can never satisfy other people. We can never fully satisfy other people, including ourselves. You know why? God didn't design it that way. Then you have pride. It can lead us to pride, this corrupt sense of personal value. When you think you are all that and you're not, you really aren't. You really, you really aren't all that. You're, you, 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 you're not. In, in the scheme of eternity, Troy, you're not either. Like, we, we have this, this unrealistic value that we place on ourselves. That's pride. And then you have idolatry, this God-like complex, this invincibility that we have over ourselves. That's what self-gratification does. That's what seeking approval from others does. But listen to me, all three of those dishonor God. All three of those disobey his commands. 
And the result of that disobedience we find in Romans 6, 23. What does it say? For the wages of sin is death. Do not, listen to me, do not think physical. This is worse. It's eternal. It's eternal separation from God forever. Forever. Forever is longer than time. We have this. And it's eaten us up. I believe that when it comes down to it, there's really two audiences that we aim to please. I believe that these are two targets that are raging war within us each and every day of who do I please? Either God or people. Now, your candidate to to sit here is up to you. This can be a parent. This can be a a child. This can be a spouse, a sibling, a friend, a, a boss. You can sit here. But I want you to imagine every day that you wake up, that you live your life in this arena, and these two chairs are constantly watching everything you do, everything you say. And here's the question we have to ask ourselves every day. Which one am I trying to please? Whose approval am I after? Is it people or is it God? From whom do I want to receive a standing ovation? Each and every day. It is a fight. I fight. But here's what you got to understand. It can't be both. Can't be both. It has to be one or the other. We just read it in Galatians 1.10. It cannot be both. It has to be one or the other. So for the rest of our time, I don't have much time. I'm just going to focus on this one. Because this is the only one that matters. So we're going to, I'm going to share three ways that we can know that God is pleased with our life. Just three quick things that will help us to please God with our life. The first is this. Believe. It's faith. And it's not just believe in faith. There's really three things within this that I believe God wants us to have faith in him, to trust him about. And the first is this, who he really is. Who he really is. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says this, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribes. What this tells me is this. He is not influenced by people like we are. Do not bring him down to us. He don't take no bribes. You see, because he's self Existent. He's creator. He's eternal. He's holy. He's judge. He is perfect. He is all knowing. He knows everything. He's all power. There's nothing he can't do. But here's the thing that's awesome He's loving and compassionate. That's who God is, was, and will ever be. He wants us to know the truth of who He is. The second one is this, what he's done. I had an opportunity a couple years ago to hang out with a Navy SEAL. I'm just telling you right now, these are the baddest dudes on the planet. These are some bad. If I'm ever in any kind of hostage situation anywhere in the world, I want them dudes coming to get me. (laughs) Them some bad dudes. But let me tell you the truth. The greatest rescue mission in the history of the world was not done by flesh, but God in flesh. Galatians 1.3 just told us that Jesus came to rescue us from an evil world. The Navy SEALs bad dudes. But listen to me, they need rescue too. They need to be rescued as well. 
See, it's through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus came to reconcile, restore, and ultimately renew a right relationship with God forever that was once eternally severed because of sin. That's what Jesus did. But here's what's so awesome in verse 4. It says that this was God's will from the beginning, before time started. This was his plan. This is what he's done for you and for me. John 6, 29 says this. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. We got to start there. Faith is where it all starts. If you don't have faith, you have no shot. It's where it starts. See, we receive God's approval when we repent and have faith in Jesus for salvation and follow him as Lord. You cannot just believe in Jesus and that's it. God is calling us to follow as Savior and as Lord of your life. See, God is pleased when we receive the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that traded his righteousness for our unrighteousness. That's a bad trade. He gave up everything. What did he get? But we got everything and gave him our sin. That's our Jesus. See, when we believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, did I say only? Only way to the Father. It's with this type of faith that Daddy is pleased. You see, it all starts with Jesus. And I pray for everyone here to start there. Today, believe in Jesus for your life. So he wants us to believe who he is, the truth. He wants to believe what he's done through Jesus Christ so we can be with him, so we can, so we can have his family back. It's what he did for us. But here's the third one, what he's doing and will do. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to have Pastor Ryan come up. Everybody get up, Pastor Ryan. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. He's already nervous. Dude, it's going to be okay, man. These are, we family. You good. Don't worry about it. Okay. Some of you, if not all, you may have seen the, the trust fall demonstration. Okay, we're going to do that now, okay? We're going to do that now, okay? Okay. Because I believe this. I believe every day God is asking you and I, do you trust me? No, 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 no. Do you trust me? And so we're going to do this, and before I ask Ryan to fall somewhere, he's going to answer the question of, do you trust me? Now, I'm going to represent, I am not God. I am representing God, and Ryan is representing you, the people, okay? So he's going to cross his hands, run his chest. There you go. He's nervous. Okay, bro. Where's your wife? Is your wife here? No, okay. She's okay. Not. She's not? Okay. Somebody better call her. Here we go. <laughs> so I'm going to ask him a question. He responds. All right. Ryan, do you trust me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. He said yes. He needs a microphone. He did say yeah. Okay. All right. Trust me. Fall forward. Oh, boy. Okay, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Trust me. Good. All right. We're going to amp it up a little bit. You okay? All right. You're going to turn around. There you go. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arms crossed. Eyes closed. You don't need them glasses, bro. Eyes closed. Yeah. Okay. Now, Ryan, do, <laughs> do you trust me? <laughs> okay. Fall back. Oh, yeah. There you go. Cool. All right. Now, turn around. Amp it up a little bit more, right? Because this is what God does to our faith. All right. Put you back up. Right on the edge there, buddy. There you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. All right. Arms crossed. Eyes closed again. Brian, do you trust me? <laughs> Dude, you have a beautiful voice. Don't act shy now, bro. Yes, yes. yes Lord, you do, right? Yes. Okay, now, fall back. <laughs> what are you waiting for, bro? 
hey, the Navy SEAL's not coming. You need to do this. No? Now, I've done this. Thank you, Ryan. You were scared. But I've, I've done this demonstration before. I've done this before. But I left out an important truth. See, at this part, this is what I would say. If you fall back, hold on, yeah. If you fall back, God's going to catch you. God's there. That ain't the Bible completely. It's not. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Here, give it for Ryan. Look. Watch, watch this, watch this. That is not the Bible completely, because you know why? James 1 says this God either causes or allows you to fall. God either causes or allows you to have a tough trial. He, he's not going to always catch you and keep you from pain. He's not. It's not biblical. But this is what I do know. It's in those painful, it's in those low places, those low moments that he shows us high things. It is. It is. It's, it, it, it's, through, it's through pain of a trial that he reveals your purpose. See, don't let uh, a trial, a fall to be a mark of, of, of some kind of defeat, but make it a sign of your destiny. Because it's in those moments where God is there. So he may not catch you every time, but he's going to pick you up. He never wants to leave you where you are. But here's the problem. You got to trust him. You got to trust what he's doing in your life right now and what he's going to do, even though it may hurt. That's who God is. You have to start with faith. You have to start with faith. Because here's what I do know, too. One of the most powerful passages in Scripture, Hebrews 11 and 6, says this. It is impossible to please God without it. To demonstrate that if you're not willing to fall, you're telling God, I don't trust you. Let this be freeing to you. Let this be freeing to you. God is m- most pleased when you trust him with everything. You, I mean, we really got to get this in our spirit. God is happy when we trust him for our happiness. God is overjoyed when we trust him to give us our joy. God is saying, when you don't give me all of you, it's impossible to please me. So it's not about you. It's saying, God, I trust you. It's impossible to please him if you don't trust him. He wants you to completely depend on him. That's our God. In order to gain God's approval and acceptance for your life, it all starts with faith. Believe in who he is, what he's done through Jesus Christ, and what he wants to do in your life. you got to trust him. Trust him. You may have lost your job. Trust him. You may be going through an illness. Trust him. You may have lost someone close. Trust him. He will never leave you there, even though it hurts. The second is this, obedience. I got to get through this. All right, I got to go now. I knew I was going to do that. Um, God is good. 1 Samuel 15, obedience. And I'm going to get to the end of this passage. It says this, to obey is better than sacrifice. God is pleased when we do what he tells us to do. God is pleased when we steward our money well, when we steward our time well, when we steward relationships well, when we steward the gospel well. He is pleased when we do what he tells us to do. When we trust him, that his plans for our life is the best life. See, the disciples in the New Testament ask Jesus this question. What are the two, I mean, what are the greatest commandments? The two greatest commandments. Like, they try to simplify it. What they were saying is that, what's the simplest way to please you? This is what Jesus said. Love God and love people. That's what he said. Notice that he didn't say love yourself. Like, right? It's always about someone else. 
He said, love God and love people. Because here's what I know to be true. Obeying people will not always lead you to love God. But obeying God will always lead you to love people. Did y'all get that? Obeying people will not always lead you to love God, but obeying God will always, always lead you to love people. And to show our love for God is to help people find and follow Jesus. And I asked myself, Troy, who have you talked to Jesus about today? Man, I ain't got time for that. Busy. Busy. To love God, to show him our love, is to share the gospel of Jesus. To show people we love them is to present Jesus to them. By taking care of the fatherless, the widow, the poor, the orphan, the broken, and the lost. See, it's through obedience that we can find ourselves pleasing to God. And Jesus Christ led the way with his life. His life for 33 years on this planet was a life of obedience. That's what he did. But here's the beauty of it. Christ's obedience to God means faithfulness to us. Christ's obedience to God means faithfulness to us. In other words, Christ saying yes to God means we benefit. When he said, Father, your will over mine, guess who got the benefit? All y'all. For eternity. That's what he did. And I know this to be true because John 6 and 38 says this. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And what is that will? To be the savior of the world so God can get his creation back. God wanted his family, y'all. God's will over our own. So when we obey, we too live out our purpose and God is pleased. So first one, got to have faith, got to believe. Second, Let's do what God's calling us to do. And then thirdly, it's worship. See, Psalms 150 says, let every breath, that everyone that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everyone who's breathing to praise God. But that's not complete worship. See, when Pastor Ryan and the worship team did an amazing job, right? Let's give it up for our worship team. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Ryan, they did a good job. But when he hit that first key, worship shouldn't have started. Worship should have started when you open your eyes up this morning. But see, when he hit that key, he continues us in worship. He don't start worship. He continues it. So our worship is found, and I ain't making this up, it's in the Bible. Worship is found in Romans 12 and 1. This is what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Here it is. This is your true and proper worship. You know what worship is? When you go to work. When you go to the store. When you go work out. When you go to Starbucks. When you go to the library. Worship is presenting God everywhere we go. It's not just singing and talking, but it's also walking. That's exactly what he's calling us to do, is to worship in everything that we do. You see, John 4 says that God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship is a lifestyle. It's not an act. It's what we do. So we need to believe. We need to obey. We need to, we need to worship. And so ask yourself again, Whose approval am I after? Who do I want to please? Is it self? Is it people? Let me warn you. As a matter of fact, let Jeremiah warn you. 17 and 9 says this. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. That's who he's trying to please? (laughs) Who really knows how bad it is? So that's who we're trying to please. But Romans 14 and 11 says this. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow 
before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God, not people. We so worried about pleasing people here and we got to hold an account to God there. We got to choose, though. God or people. To help us remember these three things, believe, be, obey, O, W, worship, we need to bow. So we bow. Bow to him. Bow to him. See, to bow means to show reverence, to yield or submit. It's a sign of humility. Here's two things I want you to know about bowing. It says this. Who we decide to bow to is who we ultimately will serve. Who you believe, who you obey, who you worship. Then here's, here's another one. Who or what we bow to on earth determines our joy now and hope in the future. If you don't have joy, who are you bowing to? If you're feeling so much hopelessness, who are you bowing to? Who are you believing in? Who are you obeying? Who are you worshiping? That's not giving you joy. That's not giving you hope. Let me tell you, it's not Jesus. Because when you bow to him, that's what you get. You get joy and you get hope. And I'm not standing up here trying to tell you that we do this in our own strength. That's not what I'm saying. Because Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Pray for grace. Lord, help me to do it. 2 Corinthians says this, when we live a life that's pleasing to God, we smell good to him. We do. That's what he says. He says we're, we're, we're a sweet aroma. Now, for most of my life, I didn't smell too good to him. I just didn't. I just, just, just funky. It just, woo. <laughs> the world, what are you doing? But the age of 33, I kind of figured it out because I wanted to smell like this to him. Like, I, want, I wanted my, my life full of worship to smell good to him. How you smell? Right? Mm-hmm. How you smell? Because this is how God, through Jesus Christ, wants us to smell like. He wants us to bow. He wants us to believe in him, obey and worship. See, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ lived an entire life that was pleasing to God. He was sent to carry out God's perfect plan of redemption through his life, death, and resurrection. But see, but even God, I mean, even Jesus was tempted. It's in Matthew 4. The devil came after him three times because the devil was trying to get him to bow, to believe in him, to obey him, and to worship. But Jesus says, I choose God. I choose God's will over the devil's. Jesus showed us how to bow. There are many people in Scripture that please God with their lives, but there was one that I want to share from Scripture that said, received a standing ovation. Never seen it anywhere. I'm, I'm not a Bible scholar. It may be in there, but I haven't seen it. Every place I've seen Jesus, he's sitting where? At the right hand of the Father. But not in this passage. Acts 6 and 7. It's the life of Stephen. Stephen was a martyr. He was an amazing man. The Bible says his face looked like an angel. And and he went out to advance the kingdom. And he was later arrested for doing that. And he was able to stand before the political and religious leaders of the day. And he gave his first sermon. I mean, Stephen brought it. Like he went back to the beginning. He brought it all the way up to Moses. And then he flipped it and said this. Y'all killed Jesus. They didn't like that. They was like, get this man. So they grabbed him, and they was about to stone him. And as he was going to be stoned, this is what it says in Acts. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Before he even got stoned, I wasn't there. 
Y'all weren't either. But let's kind of play this out a little bit. I can just see Jesus up there with, with the Father and the Holy Spirit saying, look at Stephen go. Look how honorable he is. Look how he's bowing to me, how he believes and he obeys and he worships me. Look at our boy go. And because of that, Jesus says, man, let me. Give him a standing ovation because his life pleases me. One day, can we receive that from Jesus? Because I don't know if he's going to be still sitting or standing when we get there. This Bible gives me hope that he may be. That's my girl. That's the way to stay faithful. That's the way to trust me when it was going to hurt. You bow to me. See, because here's the truth. The reward when we bow is God. It's not money. It's not trophies. It's not recognition. It's God. It's God forever. So as I close, seeking the applause of people can cause us to miss our destiny, to be misled rather than Christ-led. See, God's will has to be greater than our will. See, there's nothing wrong with trying to please people, your parents, your kids, your spouse. There's nothing wrong with trying to make them happy. The problem comes when they cause you to lose faith in Christ, when you begin to disobey God doing it, and when you stop worshiping him and you start worshiping them. That is the problem. Let me read this to you and I'll close. It's not, it's not, it's not in your notes. It's 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. This is what it says. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and it says the lust of the flesh, comes not... From the Father, but from the world. See, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So if you truly want to please God and live for him, I encourage you to pray these prayers. Just real quick. Lord, help me to trust you today with everything. Father, help me to love you and love people today. Lord, give me the strength to place your plans over my own. And finally, Father, comfort me in the truth that my identity is in Jesus Christ alone. Let's smell good to God. Let's please him with our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being so awesome. Thank you for your truth. There's only one truth. Everything else is a lie. And so, God, we thank you for Jesus Christ who allows us to, to be a sweet aroma to you. But, Lord, we have to make a decision. We have to commit that today I will bow to you. I will believe in you. I will obey you, and I will worship you with my life. I pray, God, that your will will be done in us and through us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.